Good evening, colleagues, and welcome to the inauguration lecture of Professor Oleg Riva. Professor Oleg Riva is in the Department of, <coughs> of uh, Biochemistry, uh, Genetics, and Microbiology. He is a professor in bioinformatics in the Center of Bioinformatics and Computational Biology in the Department of Biochemistry, Genetics, and Microbiology. He was awarded an MSc degree in microbiology in 1990 at Kiev State University in Ukraine, and he was awarded a PhD degree in microbiology by the Academy of Science of Ukraine in 1995. Dr. Riva continued his career as a researcher at the Institute of Microbiology and Vi Virology in Kiev, Ukraine. From 2002 to 2004, Dr. Riva was appointed as a postdoctoral researcher in the High Medical School in Hanover, Germany. He joined the University of Pretoria in April 2006 as the node manager of the National Bioinformatics Network at the University of Pretoria. In 2009, he was appointed as senior lecturer and then was promoted as associate professor in 2011. In 2020, he was appointed to full professor. Prof. Riva's research interests are in the development of new biostatistical algorithms and computer programs for academic studies, biotechnology, and medicine. He has made contributions to many different fields of study, bacterial genomics and epigenetics, next generation sequencing, linguistic anal analysis of bacterial genomes, mobilomics, metagenomics, transgenomics, genome evolution, and antibiotic resistance development. Prof. Riva is actively involved in teaching biochemistry and bioinformatics for both under- and postgraduate students. Many postgraduate students supervised by Prof. Riva now form the core of bioinformatics expertise at the University of Pretoria and in South Africa. In total, two postdoctoral fellows, 13 PhDs, 14 MSCs, and 15 honors students completed their degrees under his supervision or co-supervision. Many of his previous students continue their career in science in South Africa and abroad. Main software tools and databases developed by students under Prof. Riva's supervision are publicly available for international users from various project websites. Prof. Riva was one of the founders of the South African Society for Bioinformatics. He was the Society's Vice President from 2014 to 2016, and he is currently the treasurer of the, treasurer of the society. Many research projects led by Professor Riva are based on established collaborations with research teams in Tanzania, Kenya, the UK, Germany, Ukraine, China, Russia, and Kazakhstan. Prof. Riva, Prof. Riva is the author of more than 100 publications with an NRF rating of C1 in 2021. Prof. Riva. Professor Bakrach, thank you for your introduction. Professor Bakrach, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Professor Naidu, Head of the Department of Biochemistry, Genetics and Microbiology colleagues and students, family and friends, good evening. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to present my inaugural talk to you. With this lecture, I wish to introduce bioinformatics as a scientific discipline, its role in the modern science, 
and the recent achievements in this field that contribute towards biotechnology and medicine. Advances in sequencing and computational techniques have revolutionized modern science. However, this progress is not free from several distinct challenges and limitations associated with big data generation and processing, which I'm going to discuss here. I want to use this opportunity also to highlight prospects of the very new direction of studies called epigenetics, which refers to identification of chemical and conformational modification of nucleotides and bacterial genomes as a way to explore bacterial evolution, adaptation, and development of phenotypic properties, which are of great importance for humanity. In particular, I am going to demonstrate the involvement of epigenetic encoding in the development of bioprotective uh, bio activities of plant growth promoting bacillus and the role of drug-induced epigenetic modifications in combating the acquisition of antibiotic resistance by pathogenic bacteria. I start my lecture with a short introduction to the history of bioinformatics as a scientific discipline. This introduction is important to determine the way in which the role of bioinformatics has changed over the time with the technical development and advance of methods of molecular biology and computational techniques, which have transformed the areas of application of bioinformatics from a simple biostatistical validation of experimental results to generation of research hypotheses. Bioinformatics is the youngest sister in the family of biological disciplines. It is even younger than many senior scientists working in this field. However, its roots run deep as the need for the statistical validation of biological data was recognized at the very outset of biology as a science. We may define bioinformatics as a combination of statistical approaches with information workflows and algorithms developed for mining large arrays of data relevant to biological systems. Bioinformatics is a cross-disciplinary field of study that encompasses the modeling of biological phenomena, data processing, development of computational algorithms, and statistical validation of experimental results. Bioinformatics as an interdisciplinary field of study has emerged in the middle of the 20th century with breaking down the genetic code. Due to the efforts of Watson and Crick, Margaret Dyhoff, Walter Fitch, Russell Doolittle, and many others who pioneered studies on, on the handling and processing biomolecular information in the 1950s and 1960s, Bioinformatics has matured into a fully developed discipline today. During these initial years, the basic principles of bioinformatics and its terminology were established, such as that pertaining to the genetic code, gomology of macromolecules, sequence alignment, and phylogenetics. First 12 nucleotide sequence of an RNA molecule was obtained by Robert Hawley in 1968. In the 1970s, most theoretical foundations of bioinformatics were already established, which include sequence alignment algorithms for sequence similarity measurements and database search, protein conformation recognition, DNA sequencing approaches, and the major phylogenetic algorithms. All these basic approaches were defined and made readily available for the scientific community. However, the approaches of bioinformatics were not yet so frequently used by biologists due to the limited application of computers at that time. The dependency upon a strong computer power to cope with the ever-increasing volumes of genetics and molecular biology information was fully recognized in the 1980s. First, professional databases of DNA and protein sequences, such as GeneBank and EMBL, were created. The full power and popularity of these databases as sources of valuable data arose in the 1990s, when users received free access to these depositories through the Internet for both, searching for similar sequences as well as uploading the results of their own studies. As the sequence database grew up, more sophisticated tools for database searching were requested by the scientific community. To address this need, 
faster and later blast sequence alignment algorithms were developed and became one of the most frequently used scientific software tools worldwide. With the rapid increase of versatility of tasks to be handled by bioinformaticians, the available software tools lagged behind. This problem has required bio bioinformaticians to harbor the capacity to write their own program scripts for processing various and constantly changing types of data. Also, Python and Perl program languages, the first version of which were introduced early in the 1980s, were not created specifically for biologists. They became highly popular among bio bioinformaticians due to the simplicity of these languages combined with a sufficient power and scalability for programming all types of algorithms used in genetics and molecular biology. Later, several dedicated program libraries on Python, Perl, and R were developed in order to address virtually any biostatistical task and data visualization needs. The development of bioinformatics tools and paradigms continued in the 1990s. The methodology of the massive parallel pyrosequencing as a powerful alternative to the Sanger sequencing technique began to be adopted starting from the 1970s. However, pyrosequencing found its practical application only in the first decade of the 21st century. As to the Sanger sequencing, this technique appeared to be robust and sufficiently powerful for very first projects of complete genome sequencing of microorganisms and even first eukaryotic organisms, such as C. elegans, which, were, which whole genome sequences were assembled in the 1990s. The human genome sequence project also began in this decade. Eventually, the novel sequencing technologies, together with overwhelming advance of computer techniques and unimaginable data exchange facilities provided by the Internet, all these factors revolutionized all fields of the biological science in the 21st century. Whereas the most theoretical foundations of bioinformatics were developed in the 1950s, 1990s, many people consider the bioinformatics as a science of, the millennium, of this millennium because of the rapid increase of popularity and practical importance of these studies around the world, especially with the introduction of the NGS technologies. The term next generation sequences or NGS emerged about 20 years ago to refer to principally new approaches of massive parallel sequencing. The term NGS soon became obsolete as various new technologies of DNA sequencing have appeared to address the different needs of researchers. The term second and third generation sequencers prove more useful and informative. Several technologies that were very popular 10 years ago, such as Roche 454 and ABI Solid, have already been surpassed. They were outcompeted by several other technologies that are widely used today around the world, which are Illumina, devoted to generate massive arrays of high quality DNA reads, however rather short in length, and iron torrent technology developed to make NGS sequencing affordable even for small laboratories and clinics. These sequencing technologies remain popular. However, there are clear signs that they have already seen their best days. They are gradually displacing by third generation sequencers the SMRT PacBio that generates large arrays of long DNA reads and nanopore sequencing technologies developed to make sequencing portable. In addition to reading DNA sequences, third generation sequencing technologies record the kinetics of base calling, assuming that nucleotides at sequence loci, which repeatedly slow down the passage of the DNA molecules through the sequencer device, most likely been chemically modified or blocked. Consequently, third generation sequencers provided a new an effective way of profiling genomes for epigenetic modifications that have opened an additional dimension of valuable information to be processed and analyzed by, by bioinformaticians. 
On this slide, I summarize how the technological advance of genetic and molecular biology methods has changed the role of bioinformatics in the study workflow. From, from, from formulating a research question in the form of a scientific hypothesis to verification and approval or discarding the hypothesis by experiments and statistical data validation. At the birth of bioinformatics, its role came down only to the statistical validation of experimental results. With the beginning of the era of genetic and molecular biology studies, the methods of bioinformatics began to indulge in experimental procedures. With the introduction of rather expensive high-throughput technologies of data generation, bioinformat uh, bioinformaticians became involved in study planning and experimental design, so as to ensure high quality and sufficiency of the generated data to address the research questions of interest. Nowadays, when the arrays of data became too big to be viewed and analyzed manually, bioinformatics is involved in the data-driven generation of research hypotheses and questions that indicate a conceptual shift from the hypothesis-driven to the data-driven scientific methodology. Data-driven epistemology has been welcomed by many researchers. You can see on this slide a popular citation by Chris Anderson, who noted that biology is too complex for hypotheses and models. We can stop looking for models. We can analyze the data without hypothesis about what it might show. We can throw the numbers into the biggest computing clusters the world has ever seen and let statistical alg algorithms find patterns where science cannot. This methodological shift from the hypothesis-driven to the data-driven study has sparked vigorous debate throughout the world of academics on uh, the possible challenges of this transformation. A potential argument is the detection of a correlation between two parameters of a biological system ought not to replace the efforts to understand the underlying mechanisms connecting these parameters, because this correlation can appear only by chance. It looks plausible, of course, that with the amount of data arising, the likelihood for a random correlation is diminishing more and more, but this supposition is true only if the data generation procedures are not biased. On the other hand, even a weak bias in the data generation or dat data mining process may lead to a detection of false relations between biological phenomena. Very often we have to rely on data processing algorithms, which appear to us as black boxes. Let's name this box AI for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, of course, a very popular term now, but here I use it with a more general meaning rather than a specific mathematical algorithm. I use it to denote a computational process which is so smart and sophisticated that a researcher has no chance to understand what is going, uh, what is going on in this black box. This poses a danger to us because we cannot be critical anymore regarding the outputs of this black box if we cannot understand what is going inside. Moreover, big data processing requires using the pipelines of multiple black boxes. And this pipeline may become either multiplicators of our research success or internally generated errors. The final result may be an absolute failure, despite using properly collected and relevant experimental data at the beginning, if the data processing pipeline has some internal drawbacks, biases, or limitations. Nevertheless, independently regarding whether or not we agree with Chris Anderson's view on data-driven studies, we have to admit that nowadays we have no choice but to follow the data-driven way of research. As the data arrays that we have to work with are usually so large that we must rely on software tools to interpret this initial data in a way that these tools were programmed for. This is a challenge that we are not leading our study anymore, but contrary to that, 
the data processing algorithms lead us through our studies. Also, this plays an immense responsibility on bioinformaticians to provide our colleagues with professional support free from biases and confusions. Indeed, the importance of the bioinformatic compo component on biological study keeps growing, and in many cases, the success or, of a project fully depends on quality of the bioinformatic support provided. Modern bioinformatics must fit these requirements. However, it's not always the case that it does so. How can we keep the high standards of bioinformatics output, algorithms, and develop software tools, which have become so important for modern biological studies? The success of research project in bioinformatics fully depends on interdisciplinary collaboration to much higher extent than in any other biological disciplines. Establishing a strong collaboration linking scientists from different areas of research, such as genetics, molecular biology, high throughput technologies, computer science, and many others, is vital to gaining success in bi bioinformatics studies, because data generated from real biological systems is better suited to design bioinformatic algorithms than artificially generated data, data sets. New bioinformatics algorithms and software tools require validation in laboratories and field studies. Without this positive feedback from the field, all these tools remain mere computer games. Moreover, the possibility for bioinformaticians to run own concept-proven experiments is cru crucial for the development of powerful and accurate computational algorithms. In the following slides, I want to show several examples of recent successful collaboration projects with several international research teams. By these examples, I hope, likewise, to highlight the importance of the brand new cutting-edge third-generation sequencing technologies for epigenetic profiling and addressing practical questions of biotechnology and medicine. The latest discovery challenged the central dogma of molecular biology, implying that sequences of genes can fully predefine the phenotype of individuals. It became evident that various important properties of industrial and pathogenic microorganisms, agricultural crop production, human de genetic disorders, and cancerous cell development may not be totally attributable to DNA mutations but are also dependent on the spatial and functional organization of chromatin and on semi-inheritable epigenetic modifications. Epigenetic studies may be considered as an attempt to crack the second genetic code after the revolutionary discovery of protein encoding by DNA in the 1950s. Epigenetic modifications provide a softer encoding of the phenotype that may acquire changes during the lifetime of an individual under an impact of environmental factors, which may be then inherited by at least several subsequent generations. Whereas the role of DNA methylation in tissue development of eukaryotic organisms is relatively well studied, the epigenetics of microorganisms is still in its infancy. One of the problems is that the DNA methylation in bacteria results from two independent overlapping processes. First, epigenetic modifications is the mechanisms of the innate bacterial immunity against foreign DNA, accomplished by the activity of restriction modification systems, in which methylases prevent cleavage of the own DNA by adding methyl groups to nucleotides in the binding motifs, recognized by cognate restriction enzymes. Foreign DNA, for example, phage DNA, is not methylated, and thus is cleaved by the restriction enzymes at the recognition site. In addition to the restriction modification systems, bacterial genomes often contain active orphan methyltransferases not associated with any restriction enzymes. It is believed that this methylation may be a part of the gene regulation machinery. Another problem of 
functional linking the alternative epigenetic modifications with phenotype is that the effect of epigenetic modifications is site-specific. Methylation of a specific nucleotide within a promoter region of a gene may have a dramatic effect on the phenotype. Various methylation of neighbor nucleotides on the same or the opposite DNA strand may have no effect at all. On this slide, I show a rather complex motif of cytosine and adenine methylation in E. coli, controlled by two independent methyl transferases. Both these methyl transferases in E. coli are orphan. These enzymes create a rather complex and variable pattern of methylation of the chromosome of this bacterium, dependent on the growth conditions. This observation was published in our recent paper this year. While the importance of epigenetic studies is generally recognized, there is still a shortage of software tools to translate the epigenetic patterns into a form of information suitable to address the practical questions of medicine, biotechnology, and uh, general biology. The first project that I want to present is the study of plant growth promoting bacillus. This is a collaboration project with the University of Dar es Salaam, funded by Tia Costa Grant on development of biopesticides based on bioactive bacillus strains. Field studies were conducted in Tanzania regarding the protection of cashew trees from fungal pathogens. Several prototypes of biofungicides were constructed using different bacillus valesensis strains as active agents which showed quite different activities in terms of plant colonization, fungal growth inhibition, and plant growth promotion. Interestingly enough, whole genome sequences of these microorganisms, both active and those showing no activities, were very much similar regarding the number of genes and the order, uh, gene order on the chromosome. Consequ consequently, the question remains as to what makes several strains excellent plant protective agents to use in agriculture, while other strains with almost identical genomes do not show any activity in the field. Some clues may be found when comparing gene regulation profiles in response to the root exudate stimuli, which, provide rather different, uh, which proved rather different in these strains. One no notable difference in these genomes was that different restriction modification operons were found in this bacteria, which probably are exchangeable by horizontal gene transfer. You can see here different patterns of DNA methylation represented either by cytosine methylation depicted by green marks or adenine methylation depicted by red marks on this slide. Even in the case of two strains, where the adenine methylation was dominant, methylated nucleotides were associated with different motifs on the chromosome and thus showed different patterns of distribution. Several specific sites of methylation were found near gene promoter regions. This can explain the observed difference in gene regulation despite the higher level of similarity of their genomes. This paper was published in uh, 2019. Also, there are many publications on the role of different genes in plant growth promoting activities of rhizobacteria. To my best knowledge, this is the very first report of alternative patterns of genome methylation resulting from replacements and horizontal exchange of bacterial restriction modification systems, which can reprogram the gene regulation or orchestra resulting in significant changes of phenotype and several activities of bacteria being of interest for biotechnology. Another successful project conducted in collaboration with the Center of Anti-Infectious Drugs in Almaty, Kazakhstan, was aimed at identification of mechanisms of induction of antibiotic resistance reversion by iodine containing nanoparticles that is a promising way to combat antibiotic resistance of pathogenic bacteria. It was found that treatment of antibiotic resistant pathogens such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Staph aureus, E. coli, and Acinetobacter bomoni with iodine-containing nanocomplexes 
makes them susceptible to the regular antibiotics. Iodine is a well-known antimicrobial agent that has been used for many years as a disinfectant and antiseptic. However, the mechanisms of the therapeutic action of low concentrations of iodine and iodine-containing compounds remains unclear. On this slide, two multi-well plates are shown. The pink color of the wells depicts growth of a multidrug-resistant M. tuberculosis strain in the natrium medium containing different antibiotics for each respective plate row, with a growing concentrations from the left to the right sides of the plate. Initially, this strain could withstand rather higher concentrations of antibiotics, as shown in the top plate on the slide. However, treatment of this strain with an iodine-containing complex increases susceptibility of this pathogen to antibiotics, as shown in the lower plate on the slide. An interesting finding was that the treated bacteria remain susceptible to antibiotics, at least for a few generations, even after washing out the iodine-containing compounds that assumes an involvement of semi-inheritable epigenetic modifications in this phenomenon. Similar results were obtained on several other antibiotic-resistant model microorganisms, causing nosocomial infections, such as Staph aureus, E. coli, and Acinetobacter bomoni. Indeed, the transcriptomic study showed an altered gene regulation in the treated strains in comparison to the initial cultures, even when both cultures, the initial and the treated one, were cultivated at the same condition in the medium without the iodine complex. On this slide, the alternative gene regulation between the treated and the initial cultures is shown using a staph aureus methicillin resistant strain as a model organism. Many genes encoding proteins and non-coding regulatory RNA remained activated in the treated strain, whereas other genes were down-regulated up to a complete halt of expression. This differential regulation remained in the treated cultures even when it was cultivated on the medium without the drug. Sequencing of the initial and the post-treated cultures of Staphylococcus aureus gave some clue as to possible mechanisms of the prolonged eff effect of treatment. The major DNA methylation pattern in Staph aureus genome is controlled by an adenyl methyltransferase associated with the restriction modification operon. This pattern of methylation remained unchanged in the treated culture. Contrary to this, the distribution of cytosine methylated sites controlled by an orphan cytosine methyltransferase has changed. Figure A shows the distribution of methylated cytosine residues in the initial culture, and Figure B presents the changed distribution of methylated cytosines in the treated culture. Additionally, a significant increase of modified guanine residues was observed in the treated cultures. On this figure, you can see that the initial culture was characterized by a peak of modified adenine residues depicted by the green line. After the treatment of the culture with the iodine complex, the number of modified guanine residues has increased to the level of modified adenine residues. Guanine is not a subject for methylation, but can be oxidized to 8 oxoguanine when the redox balance in the cell is disrupted. It is known that a massive oxidation of chromosomal guanine residues may have significant consequences for the viability and phenotype of microorganisms. In the last five years, we have published 10 papers on the effects of iodine complexes on various pathogens. Four of the most important publications are shown here. Combining these results with the study on the plant growth promoting bacillus, we can conclude that epigenetic modifications of bacterial DNA associated either with activities of orphan methyltransferases or those involved in restriction modification systems or due to abnormal modifications caused by drugs, all these types of epigenetic changes may have a strong impact 
on phenotype of bacteria and can be instrumental in biotechnology and medicine. Another important direction of our study is the use and popularization of third generation sequencers by creation of new bioinformatics tools and pipelines. New collaborative links have been established. This year, we published a paper on outbreaks of nosocomial infections in Kenya associated with virulent antibiotic resistant E. coli isolates. This work was performed in collaboration with the Department of Biochemistry at Mazinda Muliro University of Science and Technology in Kakamega, Kenya, and the University of Cambridge, UK. Currently, we received a new grant from the Cambridge Africa program that will start next year. This project aims at surveillance of pathogens causing hospital infections using portable nanopore sequencer. I want to use this opportunity to express my gratitude for all the support that I received from many directions, especially at the early stages of my research career. Without this support, my long journey in science would never have taken place. First of all, I want to thank from the bottom of my life, uh, of bottom of my heart, to my mentors and supervisors of my student projects. Unfortunately, not all of my supervisors are with us anymore. First of all, I want to acknowledge the supervisor of my PhD project in microbiology, Professor Valery Smirnov, head of the Department of Antibiotics and director of the Institute of Microbiology and Virology in Kiev, Ukraine. His role in my career was very important. My first publications were written under his supervision and co-authorship. In Ukraine, in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union fell apart, it was very difficult to conduct any studies due to the shortage of funding and lack of the modern equipment and even reagents. To succeed with research project, it was vital to establish collaboration links with leading universities in Europe and worldwide. I want to acknowledge Professor Gus Priest from the Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, who provided the support for my very first international research project. Then I continued my career on the postdoctoral level for the first time as a bioinformatician in the laboratory led by Professor Burkhard Tumler in the Hanover Medical School in Germany. I was responsible for functional annotation of the complete genome sequence of Pseudomonas putida. Also, it was my first experience in programming bioinformatics algorithms on Python for genome linguistic approaches. My first international research projects on plant growth promoting bacillus were supported by Professor Rene Boris from the Humboldt University in Berlin and Professor Johan Meyer from the Swedish Agricultural University in Uppsala. We started working together in the late 1990s and remain in contact to this day, with the last paper on which we all were co-authors was published in 2018. Professor Fergus Priest passed away in 2018. As a memorial to his immense contribution to the systematics of the genus Bacillus, in the recent paper on subdivision of this genus to several sister genera, one of these genera was named Priestia. The first time I contacted Professor Priest in 1997, I wrote to him an old-style handwritten letter, as there were no emails yet at this time, in which I asked him for a help with identification of several bacillus isolates, which I believed to belong to a new species. I asked Professor Priest to support uh, my application for a short-term visit grant to his laboratory to study these isolates using numeric taxonomy approaches and 16S RNA sequencing, which were the most advanced methods these days. He sent me a letter of support, and indeed, in a few years, we had published a new species. Professor Priest was the author of many new bacillus species during his active work in this field. And I was proud to learn that the genus Priestia was named to immortalize Professor Fergus Priest's name for the fact that this genus contains the species Bacillus endophyticus, renamed now to Priestia endophica, 
that I brought from Ukraine to his laboratory in 1998. This was our joint publication together with Professor Gas Priest and my supervisor from Ukraine, Professor Valery Smirnov. I also want to thank all my colleagues and friends at the University of Pretoria in the, de in the Department of Biochemistry, Genetics and Microbiology at, and the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. I want to thank Professor Furiu Bear and our system administrator, Johann Swart, with whom we have worked together for so many years for their constant support and willingness to help. I appreciate it very much. And I want to convey my deepest appreciation to my family, my wife, son and daughter who followed me in my journeys around the world from Ukraine to Germany and then to South Africa and who have supported me all these years. Thank you very much for your time and attention to all of you who joined me for this lecture. I look forward for further collaboration with you for new breakthrough discoveries and new publications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Riva, for what I would say was a very enlightening speech and lecture. So I got to know Prof. Riva some time ago um, at pa as part of a network called the Sabina Network, which is about bioinformatics in Southern Africa. And what impressed me mo most was his ability to take large amounts of data and translate that into solutions to actually prove hypothesis and actually work with the other scientists like the biologists to actually uh, unravel these huge genomes to prove certain hypotheses. That impressed me most about his, his passion as well as his passion to actually do this through the training of postgraduate students. So that I found most impressive of Prof, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Riva. As we live in the fourth industrial revolution and big data science, his research is becoming increasingly more and more important. And of course, in his under, in understanding important uh, important uh, genomes, like we've seen recently with the COVID-19, which was actually used to unravel the, the, the genome, genome of COVID-19, which has led us to actually the discovery of your vaccines, which is actually now uh, widely being, uh, which now uh, is widely being used. So Prof. Um, Riva, thank you very much for your research uh, and your excellent contribution to, to the university. On a thank you note, I would like to thank uh, Professor Sanushka Naidu, the head of Department of uh, Biochemistry, Genetics and Microbiology, and for creating the environment that you have given to Prof. Riva for undertaking his research. Professor uh, Furi Yobert, Director of the Bioinformatics Center, you as well, thank you very much for the excellent environment and the systems that you have provided for his research. I'd also like to thank Saronda Phyllis, uh, for also from the department, for helping in organization of the, 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 the lecture. And finally, last but not least, uh, the family of uh, Prof. Riva. We've heard him uh, mention um, the, the family members. Thank you very much again for, for supporting him. And I can understand that the many times that you've actually had to sacrifice in, um, in the time that he actually spent in undertaking his research and his teaching at the university. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much again for, for attending the inaugural lecture of Prof. Riva. Have a good evening. Uh, and finally, uh, remember to vaccinate. Thank you. <laughs>